Welcome back to our series on the revival of British battlecruisers. In this episode, we will discuss the development of the Admiral class of battlecruisers. I hope you guys have enjoyed this series as much as I have. Anyway, at the end of 1915, the Admiralty would gain approval from the Treasury for an experimental battleship, of which the designs would be based on wartime experience. The armament and speed was supposed to be similar to that of the Queen Elizabeth class of battleships, but improved seaworthiness and a more up-to-date underwater protection scheme. Another focal point would be a high, uninterrupted freeboard, making it safer for the secondary battery armament and casements, as in older ships they were hard to use in rough seas and they would make the ships very dangerous. Again, a quote from British Battlecruisers 1905-1920 by John Roberts, quote, The situation was made worse by the fact that the ships seldom operated in their design load condition. They went to sea deep with a full fuel load and were generally running at deep drafts and low freeboard in the operational area. Lighter loading conditions only being likely while returning to base after an extended period at sea. End quote. High freeboard and shallow draft were to reduce the underwater profile of the ship and the difficulties with dealing with underwater damage. The length to beam ratio increased accordingly. During the period between 1915 to 1916, the Director of Naval Construction would produce several designs for battleships of various specifications. These designs would cause concerns due to difficulties with docking facilities particularly the fact that there were no floating docks that could accommodate them. The DNC preferred the designs with greater beam, due to experiments showing underwater protection being improved with increased depth, as well as the adoption of small tube boilers in order to save space and weight. The designs would be submitted to Jellicoe for comment in January of 1916. He did not seem pleased with them, saying how the Grand Fleet did not need new battleships, but escort vessels, and the only weakness in large vessels was possibly in battlecruisers being greatly concerned about the battlecruisers under construction in Germany, the three most recent ones being feared to have a top speed of 30 knots and an armament of 15.2-inch guns. Jellicoe would support the designs of a 30-knot battlecruiser, and would also state that the vessels of the renowned and courageous type to be sufficient in speed but would be lacking in protection, whose views would be supported by Beatty, who did not think the older 12-inch gun armed battlecruisers much use in action due to their lack of speed, fearing being outnumbered as well as outclassed by a faster, more powerfully armed German battlecruiser force. He was anxious to see how ships like Renown and Repulse would restore the balance in battlecruisers. In that same light, he did not think very highly of the large light cruisers, describing them as freak ships. Now, due to the opinion of these senior officers, the focus was switched immediately from battleships to battlecruisers, and by February of 1916, there were two designs, essentially a continuation of the battleship project, but with an emphasis on speed. Design 1 would displace 39,000 tons, 8,000 more than any battleship project, along with a main battery of 8 15-inch guns. While Design 2 was essentially the same thing, except it would have small tube boilers instead of large ones, saving 3,500 tons on displacement, and gave it a half-knot speed advantage over the proposed speed of Design 1. Design 3 would follow a similar line, this time with machinery to reach a 32-knot top speed. Designs 4 through 6 again would follow a similar line as 2, just with varying combinations of 18-inch guns. Coming at the request of Jellicoe, the larger gun than 15 inches should be given serious consideration, but the minimum amount of guns should be 8, as any less could produce difficulties in accurate fire control and reduce weight of broadside. Essentially cutting out designs 4 and 5, design 8 was felt that it would be rejected for being too large, not to mention the fact that delays would be probable due to supply problems with 18-inch guns and their mountings, as only Armstrong had plant capabilities to deal with guns of that size. After about a month, the DNC was asked to continue work on Design 3 in greater detail, and to provide an alternative and to increase the secondary battery to 16 5.5-inch guns. These two designs would be called Design A and B. Design B would be preferred, with the final design being approved by the board on April 7, 1916. Now, the main difference between the two designs was the thickness of armor, causing an increase of displacement. On April 19th, three ships would be ordered, with John Brown, Camel and Laird, and Fairfields. A fourth ship would be ordered by Armstrong and Whitworth on the 13th of June. And on the 14th of July, they would be given the names Hood, Howe, and Rodney, and Anson, respectively. Hood would be laid down on May 31st. The Battle of Jutland would take place that same day, and would drastically alter Hood's design. Due to the experiences of the Battle of Jutland, Hood's design was reconsidered, taking the opinions of Jellicoe during a consultation at the Admiralty. Changes would be made dated to 5th July 1916, in which the DNC was instructed to improve the deck protection and turret and barbette armor. 
Compensation for the added weight being obtained was achieved by reducing the thickness of the upper belt. Ammunition hatches and dredger hoists on the main deck were to be enclosed with one-inch bulkheads, and the number of dynamos increased from four to eight, which was already under consideration before the Battle of Jutland. Now, to quote from British battlecruisers once more, the second, Design A, the one that we've been talking about, produced at the instigation of the DNC, was for a much more drastic improvement to the protection, aimed at converting the ship into a fast battleship, end quote which involved increasing the thickness of the vertical armor generally by 50%, which, with some more minor additions to the deck protection, adding an additional 3,100 tons to the displacement. An additional feature of the design was four above-water torpedo tubes on each side on the upper deck. The DNC's proposal would result in a request for him to consider variations on the 20th of July. Three more designs would be submitted, with the same particulars as Design A, but with some changes Design B would displace 43,100 tons. 12 15-inch guns and 4 triple turrets, a 30.5 knot top speed, would carry the same amount of shells as Design A, but reduce the amount of rounds carried per gun from 120 to 80. This could not have been done without increasing the size of the shell rooms, which would have meant either a reduction in the size of the machinery spaces, and therefore a reduction in speed, or an increase in size beyond available docking limits. Design C and D would follow similar lines as Design B, with variations in the layout of the main battery. In the case of Design C, 10 15-inch guns and 2 triple turrets and 2 twin turrets, and in Design D, 9 guns and 3 triple turrets. These four designs, including A, would go to the controller on the 26th of July, 1916. Now, after considering these designs, the board approved Design A for Hood on the 1st of September, 1916. But later in September, protection would be revised again, as more analysis and more lessons from the Battle of Jutland were brought to light. And a quote from British battlecruisers once more, A. Thickness of side armor between upper and forecastle decks reduced from 6 inches to 5 inches, and between main and upper decks increased from 6 inches to 7 inches. B. Forecastle deck amidships increased from 1.75 inches to 2 inches, C. Upper deck forward increased from 1 inch to 2 inch, and areas of 2 inch and 1 inch plating aft extended. D. Main deck over magazines increased from 2 inches to 3 inches, and aft from 1.5 inches to 2 inches. E. Lower deck aft increased from 1 inch to 1.5 inches, and 1 inch, end quote. The changes would ensure that the minimum thickness of 9 inches of protection would have to be penetrated by a projectile, striking at angles of descent of up to 30 degrees. The protection would be approved in early October, but protection would be continued to be debated by Jellicoe and Beatty until the end of the war. Continued alterations to the armor scheme would be seen by an additional 55 tons for gun shields. By the 20th of August, 1917, the approximate final design of Hood would be complete. Displacement of 41,200 tons, machinery for 144,000 shaft horsepower, a top speed of 31 knots due to an increase in weight, an armament of eight 15-inch guns and two twin turrets, two forward and two aft, 16 5.5-inch guns, four 4-inch four high-angle guns, and two submerged torpedo tubes, and eight above-water torpedo tubes. As for armor, I feel like me showing a table would illustrate the armor scheme a lot better than me just saying it out loud, so I'll put that up on screen now. Alright, after that, it's important to note Hood would differ from her sisters because she was so far into building that they could not incorporate any further changes. This would be rather interesting because as of the 9th of March 1917, Hood's sisters had been suspended due to the amount of labor and resources it would take to build these large vessels, as the resources could be used instead for escort vessels in the face of German U-boat attacks, although it was not an easy decision to make because there was a great fear that British battlecruiser construction was no match for new German construction, as the Germans had six battlecruisers under construction, along with others being ordered. Now, I promise we will discuss those at some point in the future, as I do love German battlecruisers, as most of you know. Beatty would push to get Hood's construction expedited and her sister's construction to be restarted, because he wanted to be able to match the speed and armor protection of these new German ships. However, no further work would continue on Anson, Howe, and Rodney, and they would be eventually cancelled by the 27th of February, 1919. Hood would see further modifications as their construction continued. In August 1918, they would increase the thickness of the crowns of the magazines from 1 inch to 2 inches. To compensate for this, the protection of the funnel uptakes above the forecastle deck was omitted. In February of 1919, her mast would be modified, and in May, the main deck at the side increased to 3 inches of armor abreast magazines. 
To compensate for this, about 100 tons of weight would be taken out through the removal of four 5.5 inch guns and their ammunition supply arrangements were to be omitted. Finally, in July of 1919, it was approved to increase the thickness of the deck armor, which was to be compensated with the removal of the added weight from the above water torpedo tubes and their protection, and the armor walls of the torpedo control tower was to be greatly reduced. But this was never fit. While four of the eight above water torpedo tubes would be kept as a peacetime fitting for possible training purposes, HMS Hood would be commissioned in May of 1920 as a battle cruiser. I think it is really appropriate to close this video out with one final thing from John Roberts, British Battle Cruisers from 1905 to 1920. He writes, however, she was still an extension of pre-war ideas, and having evolved directly from the Queen Elizabeth class, did not fully incorporate the lessons of the war, particularly with regard to protection, which had been improved in patching together piecemeal since the time of Jutland. Major improvements in the design of capital ships were envisaged for post-war ships, but the imposition of international treaty restrictions over the construction of such ships soon brought these plans to an end, and enabled Hood to remain one of the world's most advanced designs well into the 1930s." End quote. Anyway, to carry on with something I said in the last video, go tell a loved one that you love them.